Salutations, everyone. Welcome to Victoria 3. I'm Lord Forend, and here are top 10 tips I have for starting players. So the first one, and it's not particularly counted in this list, is a tip of how annoying it is to go into tool tips. Because right now you have to wait for this nice long little circle to build up in the corner to go deeper. Guess what? There's a solution. Go to settings, look up tooltip settings, and just to save yourself pain and suffering, you're probably going to want to change it to action lock. Assuming you've got a mouse with a uh, center button, it makes navigating tooltips significantly easier. Otherwise, mouse tendency is pretty decent as is. Uh, it can still get messed up sometimes, but you'll thank me later when you start whizzing through tooltips rather than having to wait for ages to go by. Okay, tip one, actually. That was tip zero. Um, by the way, all these tips will be chaptered below, so you can simply skip to the one you would like. And there'll be more guides and more tips videos coming out later. So one of the first things I've noticed, and I've heard already people complain about it, is what's my free population in a state, right? You, clearly, I've got 3.18 million living here in Flanders in Belgium, right? But how many of those aren't working? or not making me any money. Well, you can hover over it and it will tell you, oh, you've got unemployed and peasants. What's the difference? Well, first off, an easier way of finding this statistic is to either look here where it says peasants and unemployed. I particularly find it better to look under the building tab where it actually gives you a number for the unemployed. Uh, the difference is unemployed are people who are not working at the moment, but are also not peasants. Now, if that doesn't help you, welcome to the slight confusion here. Peasants are people who are living on substance farming, basically. They, they're not in your factories. They're not at your farms. They're kind of living their own lives, trying to stay alive. They are your surplus population that you can use. You want to get that peasant number down to as close to zero as you can. Ideally, you hit zero, and you can do that um, by just constantly building new factories and resources. Now, peasants aren't particularly well educated, so they tend to take a long time to build up the higher level factories and stuff, but they fill out resource buildings really quickly. So if you have a large peasant population or you've recently gotten a large migration, US or other colonies, be aware that when a migration comes in, you will have a massive initial surplus of unemployed people. Don't panic. Yes, some will migrate away, but most of them over time will convert into peasants and then can be converted back into normal workers or unemployed by building factories. Hopefully that helps you understand the three different really types of population, working, peasants, and then temporary unemployed. Okay, tip two. People have been questioning and asking, what is the best building in the game? Well, it's pretty simple. It's probably single-handedly gold fields in terms of making money. Gold fields make a absolute massive amount of money. They give you 500 minting because they produce gold, which is not a trade good, so it goes directly into being made into currency. Now, gold fields deplete, and in fact, there is a better building, but it takes time to get there, and that is a gold mine. I'm using the South Africa example because South Africa's economy is literally based on this at the start of the game, and it sucks. Um, gold mines are what you get when gold fields either run out or if they're not easily accessible. You can build up a gold mine, and then once you build up a gold mine, as you research technology, you want to put the addition, additional production reforms on there, they can easily equal or exceed a gold field given time. Those are the single best two income buildings that I have found. There might be some specialized stuff, but for the average new player, gold is where it's at. If you've got it, build it up first. Continuing on the trend of buildings, tip number three, what's the best food building? Well, this is a very long and complicated one, so I will give it to you straight. Grain buildings. Any building that produces grain, wheat fields, um, rice fields, any of those that give you grain. And you can tell where you get it from. Um, 
if you go on to the grain details, it will tell you rye farms, wheat farms, rice farm, maize farms, and millet farms all produce a level of grain. Now, each of these produces a variety, varying level of them. So some are better than others. Wheat and millet are particularly good. Food has different value per level of it for the population. So something like meat is worth 1.5 grain, depending on the population and any taboos or likes. However, early on, grain doesn't really cost you much to make, or sorry, wheat, I should say. A wheat farm that gives you grain doesn't produce that much because you can actually go in. Oops, let me get to that. You can go into a wheat farm here. And if we were to put it all the way back to its basic stuff, it requires nothing to create and gives you already a decent amount of food. Now, it's still not enough. So obviously, as the game progresses, you want to throw on more stuff in the long run to give you more resources. Obviously, some are better than others. Better fertilizers make you more. All told, grain will give you a massive amount of food. The second best building to build early on for food is fishing wharfs. They give you fish. They use convoys um, early on. Um, well, I, right now I've got steamers and stuff on, so it's a little inaccurate. Um, basically, they use your, con your convoys, clippers, whatever, to get you fish. It's usually something early on in the game you're going to have an access of. It's very easy to build up a port, um, get more of them to go fishing with. Um, fish is a decent resource, considering it doesn't cost anything really advanced to produce. You're going to be wanting to build it a lot, especially if you're a nation with a coastline. Yes, they're expensive, um, wharfs and stuff, but overall their product productivity is decent. Um, you can obviously improve them so you get even more and you transport it better. But very quickly early on, you'll max out steam trawlers. Later on, groceries are kind of where it's at. Um, from what I can tell from the advanced stuff, um, they use a combination of resources, though. So it's not something you're going to be building a lot of early on. There we are, food industries. Um they use a variety of goods. They produce a large amount of groceries. Groceries are considered very good for almost all pops. They are worth a lot of food to them. So anyway, early on, grain buildings, specifically wheat and millet, are the best. Uh, later on, or if you don't have that, uh, fish is good. And um, cattle is also pretty decent as well. Overall, grain is the best. It's the easiest. It supplies your basic needs. Obviously, your more advanced pops are going to want meat or even fruit. Um, it's cheap. It's easy. doesn't require any education or specialized resources if you run it at a low level. Okay, tip four. Tech, like most Paradox games, is king. Whoever has the highest tech tends to be winning the game. Not always. However, unlike somewhere like Stellaris or EU4, where having a single higher level of tech suddenly just puts you miles ahead, this is much more akin to the Imperator Rome form of a tech tree, where you have eh, several different trees you can pursue and go down. However, and this is something very nice, technology spread means you will get all the techs to some degree by... I'd say like five to 10 years after the first country gets them. Uh, assuming you've got a high level of literacy and you can see the explanation up there in the tooltip. Um, so what this means is you want to focus on the tech that helps you the most. Military techs are very powerful. If you're behind in military tech, you're going to get stomped in a war. Um, just be aware of that. They're very powerful. Society is more long-term investment it's not necessarily something that gives you an immediate bonus but if you want to have a good late game you need to start researching society techs early so you can get the benefit of increased population better education which of course helps get all your other techs now when i said tech isn't king what i meant was 
let's get back to my actual uh, country here. Um, you can build universities, right? And in most games where you can build the tech building, it is really, really powerful and you want to build them everywhere. They're expensive in this game. They're very expensive. Only the richest and most powerful nations are going to be building a lot of them. If you're a minor nation, you want a couple of them, but by and large, the best thing you can do is get better education laws so you get better institutions spread to your lands, and you'll keep up. You'll be about five to ten years behind major nations, but hey, they're paying all the money to get the cutting-edge tech. Now, a single university adds a level of qualifications, which allow you to educate your populace to work more educated jobs in factories, universities, your halls of government. They don't need that if they're farming on a farm. That is very useful because it allows your population to promote quickly and fill out jobs. So it is worth having these, especially major population centers, but you're going to build them partially for that, not just tech. It also gives you innovation. What do you use innovation for? Well, innovation is, of course, in your tech. It costs a certain amount of tech to progress. And your weekly innovations, you get a base value of 50. The universities here, as you can see, we had four, we got 12. You would have to build quite a few of them, 13 or so, to equal your base level. If you can afford to do that, great. You're going to be progressing through tech really quickly. If you can't, don't panic. Worry, but don't panic. A single university is not game changing early on, other than allowing your population to get more educated. Okay, the next one is, what if you're a small nation? What do you do? Well, a very good strategy in terms of the long game is say you're playing a country like Luxembourg. For example, Luxembourg here has a very low population. I don't know what their exact starting population is because we're quite a ways into the game on this save. Yes, you can grow it internally with birth rate but unfortunately, the mortality rate is very high at this point in the game. Um, people die in accidents, women die in childbirth, children die of disease, as does everybody else. So one way to grow as a small nation is immigration. Immigration, I would say, is very key, especially if you're going to play a colonial nation like America, Canada, South Africa. Their starting populations are so low, it takes the most of the game to even get to the level that the Europeans start at. It is a European and Asian semi-centered game in terms of population, which is historically accurate. So what you should do is try and get the migration. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's pretty simple. You have a market that you're part of. Usually it's your own. In this case, we joined the French, so I could show you. The French here have an average attractiveness per their province. If we zoom out, you can see it all. If your attractiveness is higher than the average, people within the market tend towards to migrate to you. If you get it really high, you can get migrations that bring in massive amounts of population. Um, playing in South Africa, I think I had 800,000 population in Cape Town, and I got a migration giving me 700. 783,000 in a year. It was ridiculous. I doubled the population in like eight months. That's the power of it for small nations. So if you're Luxembourg, the way to do that is try and get the standard of living as high as possible, along with the standard migration. So one way to do that is keep your intelligentsia happy. If they're happy, you can get this propagandists modifier that will give you 50 or more attractiveness. Your laws and also other stuff will affect this. Religion can cause problems as well. Be aware of that. But the big source here comes from standard of living, and it is multiplied by your trade center. So your trade center is a building that you can't really control. It exists in your capital. It creates various levels of what it's at based off the size of stuff. It's a little dense to get into here. Suffice to say, the more you level up your urban level of your population, the more you trade, the wealthier it gets, the higher that will go up, the more attractiveness it will be. However, remember, it's the base standard of living that makes a difference. 
You can always boost standard of living by lowering taxes, getting rid of consumption taxes, uh, sorry, getting rid lowering taxes, getting rid of consumption taxes, or paying more wages. Uh, there are various other things that can affect it. Um, welfare in particular is very nice for that. Um, suffice to say, small nations, if you get your immigration really high, you can grow your small lambs to some ridiculously high levels. Just be aware that if you're a small nation, you still have a very limited amount of land that you can actually use. So you can never become as rich or prosperous as an area that has. Let's just look at France here for 55 versus Luxembourg's, well, six at this point. Now, to be fair, they built it up a bit. So, land matters, but as a small nation, immigration will give you the population to support the industry, to build the money, to support the soldiers, to win the wars, to get more land, to repeat and dominate the world. Okay, this next one is nice and simple. It is laws. So, most people understand the concept of tax laws. What most people don't realize is if you look at the tooltip of your tax laws here, it will tell you the change in revenue of your tax laws. Why does this matter? Well, if you're running out of money, there's a good chance your tax law is all messed up. Similar thing for your um, trade policy. Various ones give you different effects based off what you're doing. If you're having trouble with money, try changing your tax law, try changing your trade law. It's pretty simple. It can be very powerful. It can make you a lot of money. You could easily see right here is if I, for some reason, changed away from pre capita, per capita taxation back to consumption based, I'd lose 72K money and I'd go bankrupt very quickly. Um, but if I change it to proportional tax, I get 48K more. So in the long run, it's going to be worth changing towards that. However, it takes a while to do because you have to get an interest group to support your law. Speaking of laws, tip seven, your laws change your institution effects. Now, this is something that took me a while to figure out here is say we have this law enforcement one and while well, looking at it, okay, it reduces radical standard of living and state penalties from turmoil. What's not particularly clear is first off, you have to unlock it, right? You have to have police force. But then if we were to change it to a local police force, instead the police force effect would change to instead boosting the landowner's political strength and state penalties for turmoil. So if you want to support your landholders, you'd go for that. For most people, though, the dedicated police force is what you're going to want. On the other hand, militarized police force here will boost your armed forces political strength. So if you're building a heavy militarized nation, <laughs> Russia, um, You'll get bonuses. It does require a tech to unlock, but boy, these benefits can be very powerful. Reducing radicals is very key to building the city you want and the country you want without it all burning down around your ears. So be aware that various laws change that. So if you change the law of, well, let's say, church and state, you start with a state religion. Well, guess what? If you change the state religion, various other effects of institutions will change. If we were to change the education system to, say, religious schools, there would be a difference in how um, of the various effects for education here. So this would, we have 51.5 right now, as well as intelligentsia political strength. This right here would give more education access to assimilation, but we'd lose the bonuses to this. So there's a lot more customizing, customization than it would appear in the laws. So play around with it, figure out what you want. Be aware that if you change one law, it can have ripple effects on your institutions as well. Read the tooltips. Okay, the next one is several people load into this game and they're going, hey, why can't I colonize? Well, in order to colonize, there are several steps. So let's hit those. First off, you need to have a colonial affair law. And there's two, colonial resettlement as well as colonial exploitation. The reality is if you can pass one, you tend to be able to pass the others. The reality is both of them grow your colonies at roughly the same effect. Colonial resettlement, on the other hand, attracts more migrants. So if you're a small nation attempting to grow your population, 
say, South Africa, the United States, anyone who's got land to colonize, this can be very useful because it will get more people. On the other hand, if you're trying to make money from it, well, this will give you more thorough put, which is basically money you make, um, production you make from the areas, as well as decreasing substance output and wages, so it'll get allow you to make more money from your colonies abroad. Once you do that, and we're giving a quick, quick tutorial one, you can then go down to an area to declare an interest, and you can declare interest on an area. Be aware, you have to have the ability to declare an interest, which might not be something that you have initially, depending on what your nation is. You declare an interest, then you can establish a colony. Wherever it's green, you can colonize. Be aware that early on, you're not going to be really be able to colonize more than one colony at the beginning. Let's get out of this and I'll show you why. So when I start colonizing an area, right? First off, you're going to have malaria penalties, which is going to reduce the growth by like 90 until it's a state. And you research quinine, ugh, quinine and other texts that make it easier. Probably pronounced that wrong. Um, but once you get it, you'll see down here, we generate colonial growth. And then it's split among your colonies. What this means is if you have multiple colonies, they're going to colonize slower. And since colonization is pretty bad initially, do one colony and spread that to you get the whole state. Then you can start another one. Uh, if you're a larger nation, obviously you could do two. But the reality is doing four or more, even though you like, oh, I'm the first one in area, you'll colonize for like 3,600 days to you expand your colony. Of course, once you colonize, your colony will then start to expand and will take over the various land in its region. Uh, it will even take over the pretty much the natives or the unestablished state lands. Will not take over other co colonial powers lands. And in fact, tension is quite a thing. I accidentally triggered a war with Netherlands over Dutch Belgium, which I was conquering as Belgium. Uh, uh, the Congo, Dutch Congo, as I was conquering it with Belgium, it pulled in Spain, Great Britain, Portugal, Italy, Russia, Prussia, and Austria over what probably was a tiny city with 50,000 people in it. So colonization can be tricky. Set up your colonial, basically, policy. Pick where you want to start. Pretty much do one colony until you get the needed tech. And various techs here will improve the level at which your institution can be at, and the higher the institution, the better you are at colonizing. The big one here is malaria prevention. Um, this will remove severe, ma severe malaria penalties, which is amazingly good. And don't forget that your institution up here, you want to get this as high as possible for colonial growth generation because it affects the amount generated by your population in incorporated states. More population, you generate more. Less population, it's harder. So if you're, say, someone like Belgium, it can take you quite a while to colonize, but you're going to be faster than if somehow Luxembourg colonized. But someone like Russia is going to be able to out-colonize us all with ease. Okay, next tip. Nine, we're almost done. You're going to want to change your production methods in your buildings a lot. And yes, you can go down to an individual building in an individual state and change it, or you can just go to the building tab here and it will sum up all your buildings. It'll put a very nice little exclamation mark here when you've got something you can upgrade. Now, if you played the tutorial, and I do recommend you do, you will know that sometimes you don't necessarily want to upgrade your production methods because it can cause problems with goods. Well, it tells you what the substitution cost will be down here. The reality is if it massively increases your production levels, um, you kind of want to do it. <laughs> the reality is that's pretty much why you'd want to take the upgrades. So like here we got clothes, 800 if we upgrade to electronic sewing machines produce more it also decreased the amount of laborers the goal in the long run is to get the amount of laborers very low because then those people can be used in other factories to make you more money there you're going to want to keep checking this basically every time i researched a tech or got one through spread i'd either unfortunately there's no way to say automatically upgrade 
your attack from or your production method through the technology. You have to go here, but keep an eye on what the tech announcement is, then you can go in here. Otherwise, you have to search through all this. Remember that there's both urban buildings, rural buildings, which are completely different. Then there are development buildings, which include your military. This is how you upgrade your military units, as well as, you know, field hospitals and the like. It's also where you change your ports. Make sure you upgrade your ports. This will give you more convoys so you don't run out for your trade routes. It is a massive boost. This is 330. This one is 11,000. It's huge. Same thing for rail. Rail can make a big difference as you upgrade the various cars and stuff. You'll see, obviously, it costs more infrastructure, but you transport more goods. And finally, the construction one here only has one change, but it's important. Build with wooden buildings, build with iron frame buildings, build with steel buildings. The real reason you upgrade in this case is it allows you to construct, gives you more construction points as well as faster construction. Just make sure you constantly check it. Mistake that I made and I've seen other people make is not keeping an eye on it. If you don't keep an eye on it, you're going to fall behind. And then once you fall behind, it's going to start a death spiral as your factories are not as productive. Therefore, they don't make as much money. Therefore, their rivals outcompete them. And then you lose your economy and death spiral type stuff. You can get around that, obviously, by subsidizing the marketplace. But the best method is to stay constantly upgrading your production methods through tech and then actually change them on the menu. And the last one, number 10, and this is the one probably a lot of you have wanted to hear. Well, if I played Victoria 2, I remember all these uh, merchants and investors running around and upgrading and building factories that would then go bankrupt and other stuff. Well, they've changed that a bit. There is, in fact, an auto upgrade. You can do it yourself. And early on, I recommend you do it yourself. But if you're a nation on the size of the United States or Russia, you're going to get a little bit overwhelmed. There is an auto construct thing. Be aware that your construction pool up here is global. Uh, the amount you produce and can build the buildings is a global modifier, not a local one. But what you do is you click on a factory and there is an auto expand button and it will tell you the conditions under which it will do the auto expand. The biggest one is that the cash reserves of the mill itself so it doesn't go broke or being destroyed. It has to build up on its own, which means it can take a very long time for the auto upgrades to work. They do work, and it's very nice not to have to worry about them during a war or something. Um, as you can see, the conditions are reasonable. Market access is good. Cash reserves is good. Basically, is the building making money? And am I not producing? ordering any other things to be built. This is why the global construction pool kind of hurts. But if you say you're building a building and you know, wow, this is going to be a great building. It's an iron mine. I need iron. There's plenty of workers. Don't wait for the auto expand. Do it yourself. Just build it, upgrade. It's a slow process. It helps once you got the engine going to keep your factories and everything else building, but it doesn't start that engine on its own very quickly. Be aware that you have to go through and do it a lot on every single building. I haven't found a way to automate it. If there is, I'd love to know. Be aware not every building can be automated on upgrading stuff that don't produce anything that makes the money like universities, like government buildings. You do have to upgrade those manually, which is fine because you tend to centralize them anyway. There you go. Hopefully this has been a very helpful guide to you. Uh, I'm going to do other ones. I'll actually probably do like an economy guide in a day or so, along with the military, political, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is just tips for you as you're starting out. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, leave a comment, mention your own tips, and I will uh, subscribe, of course, if you haven't done so. And I'll see you guys in another guide, let's play or live stream. Bye for now.